hey, here's uh, four ministers that are talking about preaching this week. Some of them are doing lectionary, some of them aren't. So we're just gonna see where this goes. Let us pray. We encounter word. Some of it we've known quite well for a long time. Some of it, it's newer. And from that, we wait on the Holy Spirit to give us some way of uh, proclaiming this word in a way that's new and fresh and uh, relevant to, to, to who we are now. And we just ask that we be mindful of that process and joyful of that process. Amen. 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 Okay. So this is, a, this is an Independence Day uh, service for some people. And uh, for others, it's, um, it's the 5th of July. <laughs> this coming Sunday. So, uh, so yeah, uh, why don't we start talking about this, uh, this Genesis text, um, which may or may not be a love story. Go. Well, the, thing, the, the, the two things that I like about, or I, I appreciate about this text are first that um, we actually see Rebecca having agency, which doesn't often happen. She's asked, do you want to go? Mm. And she's allowed to say yes or no. Mm. And, and then she's the one who sees Isaac in the distance and says, whoa, <laughs> and, and reacts to him. Um, so there's, so th that's kind of unusual. And then, and I, and I haven't verified this, but the other thing that I think is really interesting is the, um, th that Isaac loved her. Like it says full out that Isaac loved her. It's not like with Jacob loved her best, mm. um, you know, where it's a comparative where Rachel's just better than Leah in his eyes, or it's just flat out. These two actually love each other. You don't see that with Abraham and nice, Sarah. That, that, that relationship comforted him after his mother's death. Right. And I think that what we talked about a little bit last week with the um, Isaac not really having a whole lot in the faith development, um, what we see here is God still staying true to the promise and sticking with him and even getting down into the nitty gritty details of Isaac's life to make a difference mm. and to keep that promise going. Right. Even though it's not Isaac's, uh, you know, Isaac's not going to be the father of the 12 tribes. He's the father of the two. Right. Um, yeah. You think this is just because this is the year for doing uh, Genesis in the summer? Like, how does this have to do with where we are? It, it happens. Uh, we Every usually year. read from Genesis during the summer. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. This is just the, well. This is the semi-continuous track. Yeah. yeah. The uh, the interesting in the calendar they throw the Song of Solomon uh, in there. Mm -hmm. It's another love story. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the marriage psalm to, mm -hmm. is the other thing that's paired with that. That is the mar marriage psalm, isn't it? That's with Song of Solomon. That's not with this one, is it? No. Well, you have a choice of Song of Solomon or the marriage psalm. Right. To go with this if you're doing lectionary by the book. Oh. Uh, but then Zechariah, yeah, you, Zechariah can do, you can do do Zechariah with um, 145. Right. Which is the psalm of praise. Right. And then Romans and Matthew are consistent, whichever route you go. Right, right. Hmm. So tell me, Drew, um, when the servant of Abraham comes to the family, this is a very patriarchal thing, right? To have Abraham send his servant to go find a wife for Isaac. Do you think? Isaac knows this is happening at this point in time. Is Isaac the one, do you think he went and said, hey, dad, I, I think I need to get married? Or do you think this is just um, an impetus from the patriarchal society of the time? You know, I've kind of turned to you because. Uh, uh, yeah, I haven't studied it specifically, but that's what I've always assumed. That's what I would assume. On this. You could, and you could turn to me on that one if you, about other yeah. cultures. 
doctors, just anthropology wise, you know, they had coming of age, which uh, many modern anthropologists think that's what's wrong with Western culture is that we don't have these coming of age points where there's certain expectations of how you should behave and be. It's harder when it's all like out there. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've cultures within our own we have subcultures within our culture that still do that, you know, the Amish and, uh, yeah. and Hasidic Jews, where you reach a certain age. And of course, some people who are, are Indian um, that live in this country that still have, um, have a, a different way of viewing marriage. It's more of a contract. It's more of, it will be compatible because our families are so similar and have similar values and know each other. And so it's more likely you're gonna get along. and and the romance comes after. Um, so yeah. you, think, you said it, says it might be a good idea to point out to folks in the congregation that they did not buy a house first and then have a baby and then get married. <laughs> you know what, like, let's not talk about this right now because it's getting too close to home. Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, and what I think is interesting with that too is that a couple of weeks ago uh, when we were talking about Hagar, um, and and Ishmael, you know, being exiled into the desert and God hearing them. As the story continues and it says, you know, they found the water and then he grew and then she arranged for him to have a wife from Egypt. So mm -hmm. that was interesting. It wasn't a Abraham jumped in and said, okay, well, I know you're still alive. Let me arrange for something for you. It was her that did it. So I guess a mom could do that too. Well, I think it also points to the, something that we don't really understand in our modern age, which is the idea of kids as children. Uh, excuse me. Yes, kids are children. Kids as property. <laughs> oh, as property, certainly. Yeah. Right. So Abraham really feels he has the right to do this. In fact, he even says, I'm not going to get a wife for Isaac among all these weirdos that I'm, you know, living yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I came from. And the servant's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. They're not going to know who I am. What if this woman won't come with me? What am I supposed to do? The very, I think it's a very complex cultural thing that, I'll be honest, I'm not that versed in, in terms of all how all of this takes place. And I still, I still go back to my question, where is Isaac in all this? Mm -hmm. Is he involved or are they just, you know, get her back and say, here she is. No, no, he, maybe does, he's he just does what he's told to do. Maybe he's 16 and, and, and he has not, re he's reached, uh, he's, he's reached one stage of coming of age, but hasn't reached the final age of majority. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess it's a little bit racially. It's a little bit racially charged. I, you know, these people aren't good enough for my for my yeah. son. I'm yeah, going to yeah. go home and get somebody from my family. Yeah. Right, people that yeah. I know who are like me. And to to that send a servant. Happens. That still happens. To send the servant, who the implication is the way he's talking, kind of third per or, uh, disconnected from the Lord. Um, you know, as this is my master's God. Um, so the servant is clearly not really of Abraham's people as well. And so now he's got to go and say, hey, my relatives weren't good enough. Uh, let me go find someone over here. I know, and he did it. And then he, he seems to almost have a conversion because he seems to, the, his language about God changes a little bit as well. Mm. So, you know, that well, this, this is the God that's involved with people's lives too, what you were saying earlier. Right. Right. And that, you know, it's sort of like the story of Jesus sending the disciples in and to, to get the donkey, you know, mm -hmm. well, how did that happen? Well, you know, God makes these things happen. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, Tell the people that the Lord needs the donkey. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Get me the woman. Get, get, get the woman. Get the get woman. A woman. Yeah. It's, we got camels. We get the woman. Very property or, oriented and, and camels are, are very important here because you have to water the camels and water is very important in the same way that was with Ishmael and Hagar and it's, and it's all I often, often have thought about that story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well mm -hmm. uh, and it's Jacob's well. Uh, I've often thought that's a, an interesting uh, yeah. narrative in John 
uh, yeah. that, that happens. It's almost like a replay yeah. of uh, Isaac and Rebecca. Mm -hmm. hmm. Have yeah. you guys you get you guys read the uh, the red tent by uh, Diamati the the red woman? Red tent, yeah. Oh look, I have right here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I haven't. Well, that's a really good. Uh, it was by a, a Jewish uh, rabbi, a woman, uh, who wrote it, and uh, it really covers the history of the matriarchs and the patriarchs. And it's written from the perspective of Dinah, who was in Egypt, uh, yeah. and telling this story uh, about how she got there. And there and, is uh, anyone finer? And actually, I think in that book it uh, oh, talks about Rebecca and uh, Isaac really having a love affair. Mm -hmm. uh, they were deeply in love. I will, um, I will drop it off in your post box for you to read. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll just pick up a copy. Well, I have a copy here. Like, <laughs> really? why, why would you pick up a copy? Because no. I probably won't get around to reading it tomorrow, and then uh, your I book will basically become a part I of my life. You know why? I got it from John Scotland. <laughs> and John Scotland gave it to me because it was on the shelf um, at, where the books are for sale. No, no. There was a bunch of them. There was like four of them. You're like, Gene, you I know. I have four copies because I give them out to people. Now you got three. And the fourth one is going to go to Drew. And when Drew's done next year, the year after, we'll bring it back to you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, I'd like to, bringing us back, I'd like to also point out at the end of this story, when Rebecca does see Isaac and says, ooh, who's that? They go to Sarah's. Tent. Yeah, right. He goes with mom. I, again, I see the that father and son are not tightly tied together. Uh, yeah. In a patriarchal society, the oldest son should be living with his father, caring for his father. His wife, that his father's servant found, should be <coughs> there with them. But yet, he doesn't they, have to worry though because he's the only one. He's the only son. It's not just the oldest. But, but, he, but he should be caring for his father. Yeah. Right? I can understand why. Uh... Yeah. And, and I still think that that whole sacrifice of Isaac up on the mountain just broke that family. It just broke it. Well, and obviously we're going past the text and I don't even know what's yeah, going on next. Yeah. But in all honesty, it makes me think about Jacob and Esau. Yeah. So, you know, here is Isaac so attached to Esau because I'm going to be the better father than, you know, my, my father. My father was. Yeah. And even though it's, you know, supposedly prophesied that the, the younger is going to be the dominant one, he likes his mom. I'm just going to, I'm just going to be with this guy. He liked and, me. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Good steak. You know, why not? Um, but it's, you know, You've really, uh, in exploring this, Debbie, the last couple of weeks, have really opened my eyes to things that I wasn't seeing in the text. So thank you for that. By the way, it doesn't go beyond the uh, um, lectionary, because the lectionary goes through um, 67, verse 67, where um, Sarah took, some, took, some, took her veil and covered herself, and the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her, Rebecca into his mother Sarah's tent. He took Rebecca and she became his wife. So that's the that's the end of the story in the lectionary. Oh no. I wonder, I'm no, I meant Jacob and Esau takes a Oh if, if and he loved her. Hold on wait. I have it ending with success. And he loved her and Isaac was comforted after his mother. After his mother's death, yeah. Yeah. I wonder if uh, this happened before the sacrifice. No. -uh. No. Well no, no. In the sacrifice, he's referred to as a boy. Yeah, yeah. but in the, it, 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 the assumption that Sarah dies at the time of the sacrifice. Well, the sacrifice is yeah. in, in, in chapter 22, and, and, the Sarah, and the Rebecca story is chapter 24 when Isaac is older. Right, I think John is wondering if it's out of chronological out of order in the scripture. Oh. But, you know, I, I think that it was. Maybe, maybe what happens is uh, years later, uh, 
she finds out what happened on the mountaintop and that that broke her heart. I'm, you know, who knows? Oh, that, oh, yeah, I see. But I don't, I don't yeah. go there with Oh, you. I see. Sarah, yeah. Because everybody did human sacrifice then. And the Canaanites certainly did. Like, we have evidence of that. So as much as you wouldn't like it, that's the ultimate sacrifice to your God. The ultimate sacrifice to your God is your firstborn. And but but when the only reason you're following you the reason you've chosen this god to follow versus all the other options is because this god has promised you a kid and now you're going to kill that kid i, I mean so i can god. see it being more than more for sarah than merely yeah, oh well human but, sacrifice but, is cool. but but i mean so many cultures have trickster gods and yeah. so and god sometimes is a little tricky you know i don't know I'm just, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I hear what you guys are saying and I like that conversation, but I don't know if that, that feels like we're viewing it through our own culture. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult story to follow and it's a difficult story to understand because I think the culture is so different and mm -hmm. I, I do my work and I should, you know, study. Weirdly, I mean, this is so weird. I don't think I said this before, but weirdly, my oldest son, who I was just besotted with, you know, I was at a point where I didn't think I was ever going to get to have kids. And I, I have this kid and he's just like, he was, I worshiped the child, which is not cool, but I did. And his first shots, like he got a couple of jags when he was born, you know, they give them to you in the hospital, but his first round of shots was on May 1st. And I was like, oh, that's Beltane. That's the five years of Beltane. That's when they would have thrown the firstborn child into it. And what if I give him shots on this day? And then he like, then it's real. And he ends up like autistic because back in those days, they were like, don't do shots. It might give autism. Right? And I was just like, mm. so I didn't have the shots done until June 1st. Because I was, I was just like, what if this is like, oh. Oh gosh. Totally mental. <laughs> All right. It is, but, the, but, but, but we live in, a, we live, we still are in a multicultural and a multi-faith situation, uh, uh, regardless of who we are, you know? I mean, how many of us say, oh, bad karma, you know? Oh, yeah. in my next life, I don't want this. We don't maybe really believe it, only except a little we do. Mm -hmm. I mean, if people say, oh, no, no, I don't, I'm going to challenge them that maybe a little they do. So. Yeah, no, I can't stand those, both of those phrases. Um, but then I also can't stand when someone, when I say, you know, good luck. I don't believe in luck. All right, fine. I get get over You're a better Christian than I am. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And I and I admit I, I do that when, you know, someone says, oh, that's bad karma. I'll be like, well, I don't believe in karma. And I'm just being the same jerk. So. <laughs> <laughs> At least you're an honest jerk. Yeah, I had a guy leave the church out of, over a sermon I did on hope. And uh, he said, hope is a Buddhist concept. It's not a Christian concept. Oh, come, come. Okay. What? Whatever. What? Whatever. We live in love. Whatever. Faith, so, hope. Faith, hope, and love, right? Right, yeah. Faith, yeah. Is love. What? And the only reason love is the greatest is because that's the one that won't go away. If you, once you see something, you don't need to hope for it anymore. And once you mm. are in something, you don't have to have faith that it will happen. You know, faith so faith and hope not disappear seen. and love remains. Let's read the let's read the gospel. Let's get okay. up. Yeah, get up. What's the what's the uh, chapter and verse? It's uh, 11, 11. 16 to nineteen, and then it skips over some uh, some fun stuff, and then goes from twenty five to thirty. Twenty five to thirty. Right. Yeah. What's the fun stuff? Oh, uh, some, uh, you know, Jesus uh, condemning some things. Oh, yeah. He's called a glutton and a drunkard. That's my favorite part. <laughs> I, I do love this, this particular scripture. I do too. Yeah, this, we gotta, we gotta get the drunkards in there. It's, you know. Well, and I love how it's complaining about the generation too. Cause but like, to what, to what will I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another, we played the flute for you and you did yeah. not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say he has a demon. And the son of man came eating and drinking and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. And then it jumps to 20 or 25. 25, yeah. 25. 
At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all, all, you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I saw that on the side of the road yesterday. The yoke is easy? Hmm. Yeah, it was, in, it was in Ocean County and it was like a, a series of signs on the farmer's field that oh, had yeah. the whole thing there. Burma <laughs> cave. Hmm. Well, I was going to say, I, I mean, I love that, but to what will I compare this generation? I think whatever generation we're in, we just see the brokenness and see the people not getting on. It's just part of being people, you know? Well, and the other, a few other times that Jesus says generation, I think in Matthew, but also in Luke, he, he likes the uh, term adulterous generation. Mm -hmm. And that adulterous, though, is a Hebraism that comes more uh, into Greek, and it's that particular one is often is typically used for idolatry. Mm -hmm. And so, when does this one have that? So this doesn't, but I think it's got the same concept here, and you can see the parallels in the Gospels, because here, you know, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. This is how we treat God. God, I, I did this thing for you. Why didn't I get that? Um, or, yep. you know, I, all the bargains we make with God, all the ways we want God to look like ourselves. Mm -hmm. We didn't mourn for us. You know, what, what's going on? And then, but we're not going to believe John is from God because he, he does yeah. <laughs> But we're not going to believe Jesus is from God because he does eat. And Everything. Drink. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so. Yeah, have it both ways. Exactly. And, you know, then he says, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. And I had never thought of this before, but, um, and I'm usually the first to find anything Christological, but um, someone, uh, someone I read uh, called this a Christological declaration, declaration where Jesus was identifying himself with Sophia. Um, with yeah. with wisdom. Yeah. yeah. So that here it would be it might be better capitalized. Wisdom, as in God's wisdom, God's word, me, um, is vindicated by my deeds. It's also would then be a feminization of God as well, which aren't common, but mm. are important to notice because, you know, God has no gender. Well, um, I, I like, I like the, the part that does say the children play the flute for you and you didn't dance. It makes me think of Isaiah saying um, back in Isaiah 58, look, we fasted for you. Didn't you notice? You know, yeah. That whole thing. We did this thing for you. God, come on. We put on sackcloth. We're we, good. Yeah, we're good, aren't we? It reminds me of the, you know, the Lord as a, as a gumball machine. You know, you put the quarter in and you get the gumball out. And as soon as you don't get the gumball, you think this damn thing's broken. You know, I'm not going to deal with Funny. it. Well, I, I, I just, I've never thought about it in terms of uh, us before God. I've always thought of this text as about uh, how fickle people are, uh, <laughs> about the generation that uh, just won't listen. And, you know, you, you're just about to talk about uh, both these models, uh, Jesus and John. Um, and what I've always thought about is the story of St. Francis, who, uh, you know, during a catastrophe, um, or he would, uh, there was, what was it? He would sing and dance and uh, he could not get people to be happy. And he just kept dancing and kept dancing until his feet were bloody. And, uh, and he was, you know, just tired out and weary. And then, then they started laughing because he was uh, dancing so long and- uh, Cool for God. Yeah. With a bloody, uh, 
yeah, and it's just a, a story about, uh, you know, you just can't uh, measure the effectiveness of witness by uh, people's reaction and what they do. Uh, it's an argument against uh, outcomes, <laughs> uh, outcome objectives. Um, uh, trying to force an outcome. And I, and I think that, that you can look at the, these, both of these as, as essentially trying to force God to an outcome. Look, we did these things for you. It's like a general, you know, it's, it's like these kids today, you know, uh, what are they doing? They're dancing in the street. They're, they're, they're you know, they're playing their flute. Mm -hmm. They're making a lot of noise. They're painting Black Lives Matter on the ground. You know, what are we doing here? What's this generation doing? Well, and, you know, speaking about the wisdom in 25. People just won't listen. The wisdom doesn't go to the intelligent. You know, the hidden things are revealed to the infants. Yeah. And then a very Johanna. Just, uh, just substitute deplorable there for infants. That's all. Uh, Let's not be political, right? This. We have to be political. Christ was. <laughs> yeah, but there's we no can more. Be political part 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 there you go. Partisan, yeah. Partisan. That's what we're talking about. Exactly. Why the no, intelligent it's... versus the other ones who are the deplorables. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think, yeah, I don't, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, uh, but I, I mean, this that has to do with again size of government. That you know, so no, I mean, it has to do with anti uh, anti intellectualism and anti reason and uh, not thinking. That's a it's it's it, uh, partisan though. So I, I think it would be wrong to say that anybody that that uh, well, I guess we'll just come right out and say it. We've got people that we know that vote uh, that vote Republican because they want a large, I want a smaller government. They want the government to be organized in a different way that are amazing Christians and give a lot of money and care and love. And so I think if we just paint but deplorable because of how it's been used is basically saying that if you're deplorable, then you vote a certain way. That's not the context in which she used it. That's not what she was saying. Well, it didn't it, have anything to do not, with I mean, but, it had but, to do with Republican <laughs> Democrat. It had to do with uh, intellectualism and reason and people that had gone gone to school. But that was right against this text because it says because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to the infants. So therefore, the deplorables are the ones that are going to get the information. Right. Oh. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Okay. That's why it, it really wasn't a. I mean, obviously, that word is now. It is. It's, that it's, word it's like is black, changed. It's like Black Lives Matter, which is an right. amazing thing, and it's Black Lives Matter, and we have to fix this, is now got so much political stuff that is can be interpreted as blue lives don't matter, that yes. we get into a dangerous place of using that because, you know, we just do. Right. Yeah. Because, because it's taken on a life of its own. Which That's then makes me want to criticize the generations because if it had just been Black Lives Matter two, it would have we would there would never have been this confusion. But instead, we got to make everything so pithy and catchy on the internet, and you know, much like defund the police versus reform the police, yeah. reform yeah. the police. Yeah. I think people would all go for everybody. Right. Yes, reform, defund the police. Well, now we got to be <laughs> exactly. really and go over the top with it. And yeah. it's like come on, people, language matters. Yeah, but anyway. Um, uh, history matters too. Yeah, and and history matters, you know, in this as well because you know the thing we skip over is the woe to unrepentant cities. But he's yeah, talking, why I I'm uncomfortable with the pick and choose. So the lectionary often does that. They yeah. they get rid of the uncomfortable things, and that this is probably my biggest criticism of the lectionary. Me too. But here you've got, he began to reproach the cities in which most of his deeds of power had been done because they did not repent. And so Jesus is talking about his, his deeds of power, which are healings, are, you know, all these are these good things. And here are these cities with, um, that are centers of power. And he's saying, woe to you. And then the, these Gentile cities, if I had done these things in their cities, they would have repented and been in sackcloth and ashes already. There's another Isaiah 58 
yeah. um, parallel. And, you know, I think that happens so often. We, you know, in the church, we see, we can see God doing something. And if it doesn't fit with how we thought God should have done it, if, yeah. he, if God's not dancing when we thought he should have danced or mourning when we were wailing, um, then we tend not to believe it. But when someone who has no background in God sees the amazing things that God has done, they respond in new ways. And, you know, I think it's one of those things that, you know, Jesus is hitting at the religious establishment here and kind of saying, y'all are judging me, but you don't know what's going on. Here's the reality with these cities. And now I'm going to flat out tell you I'm God, because if you've seen the father, you've seen the son, if you've seen the son, you've seen the father. So that's who I am. And by the way, you all are making it hard. I'll, I'll, I'll go into this 10 chapters later um, where you don't lift a finger for anybody in how you interpret the law, but I'm going to say it right now. My yoke is easy and my burden's light. I am humble. I am gentle. You are not those things. Exactly. That's a big lie. <laughs> okay. What? <laughs> I know, because moving those tables in the fellowship hall, that's a lot of work. That was a joke. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still trying to get John's. Yeah. Um, every time, every time I read that at the funeral uh, thing, I go, "Oh my lord!" Um, who who really believes that? Who's a follower? Who's a disciple? Believes which part that he that Lord is humble and gentle in heart, or that his yoke is easy? My which yoke is easy. Oh, oh and my, I bur my burden is light. I think I think being a follower of Christ is to take up a pretty big cross, and they're not easy to carry. So I'm right. kind of I, I understand what you're saying with that. Although I, I like the idea of yoke because it's a shared burden. Yes, he's with you. He's with you in it. So yes, you're carrying the cross, but you've got him carrying with you. Yeah, yeah, and and it's all about where you put it. You try to carry it with your back, it's going to kill you. But if you try, if you get it above your shoulders, it's a lot easier to carry. And that's the whole purpose of a yoke. Yeah, and that's and it's if you to redistribute the weight so that you can do more than would be possible, whether you're a human or an oxen. And it makes me think of something I I heard from Dallas Willard in a um, in a podcast I was listening to the other day back from the Frank Pastore show where Willard basically summarized Christianity as knowing who Jesus is, what Jesus did, and then trying to do the next right thing. Knowing that your yoke, your yoke is easy and your burden is light. If you don't get it right, that's okay. But you try to do the next right thing in each step. That's, isn't Whereas, that from Frozen too? Well, it is, which I love. Do the next right thing, but this was way before. I did my whole song. Well, I, I absolutely well, love that song. Was listening to cool people. That song is is Easter Saturday. Like that, I I, I did a whole my Easter Sunday sermon was on that song. But anyway, um, I have to watch that show again. It's I love that movie so much. It's you fantastic. Little girl, my daughter's right? obsessed <laughs> with it. Yeah. Yes, you have to see it a lot. Um, I know all about Thomas the Tank, Tank Engine from twenty years ago. So yeah. yeah but the too. idea of the the yoke, the burden being light, is that if you're doing if you're doing God's will in order to earn favor from God, it's a heavy yoke. Mm. If you're doing God's will, everything is just as hard. But if you're just doing it because you're responding, because you've already been filled up by God's love, mm. then the burden's light. It's just a difference in perspective. I, I don't see that written there. That to me is one of that's the... That's not how I read that text. That's one of the ways that um, I think that I really am just sort of genetically predisposed to be Calvinistic on some level. Because, because I know that I am like completely depraved, <laughs> And I'm horrible in every way, but I'm just doing my best. I think that does make the yoke somewhat easier because I'm just like, God, you're going to have to help me with this because I'm a mess. I'm a hot mess. And the only way that I can do anything that's not just selfish and stupid is because you're in this with me. 
just saying. I mean, I'm really open about my brokenness. So anyone who knows me knows I have a very, I have a very low opinion of myself when it comes to who I am just as an individual, good or bad. So and it's not an excuse. And it's not an excuse for being bad. You know, when I'm bad, I don't say, oh, well, I'm just totally depraved. But on I some I was reading some commentary on this earlier today, and it said that, you know, it said, follow the three words, come, all, and rest. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I had not noticed, uh, uh, I'd noticed the all, but I, uh, and the invitation, of course, but she, the person I was reading pointed out, you know, the number of places where the invitation is issued of mm -hmm. come, uh, you that are hungry, you that thirst, you know, uh, Isaiah, and, uh, but, um, and the uh, rest, she talked about the fact that, uh, you know, we, we do have heavy burdens and heavy uh, uh, responsibilities to carry, but uh, that uh, the peace and the rest that come is uh, so fulfilling and it's so promised. And that was about the yeah. presence of Christ with us. Um, but the all is what I focused on. Yeah. You know, come, come to me, all of you. You know, the... Um... That you don't rest, see that very often. Rest is Sabbath. And that's one of my big things is that so many folk that I know who are professional Christians, or if they're not professional Christians, they like are way up in the, they're, they're a highly trained amateur Christian. Um, they're spinning plates. It's all too much. They've got so much. They're doing so much. Blah, 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 blah. Those are oftentimes the people that literally don't take a Sabbath. When yeah. God took a Sabbath. So... Yeah that if, if you really, if you're really doing it and you really are letting God do, do the heaviest of the lifting so that you're there in the yoke, but your burden isn't so bad, then you are going to take that rest really serious because you're weary and you're, you got he carrying heavy burdens and you can share it with this yoke and, and you're going to get that rest. Yeah. If I could go back to what I preached today, I preached about all, you know, because uh, I was preaching using the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, all, well, all people are created equal. I thought of that when you said that. Yeah, and I went to that passage where um, Paul talks about, you know, we are all of one body. You know, we are all baptized by the Holy Spirit. And there, in that passage, um, it's, uh, it's 1 Corinthians 12, and we have a variety of gifts. And the same God who activates all of them in everyone, all the members of the body, all in one body, all baptized. And that all is so huge. It's inclusive. And then when you read something like the Dec Declaration of Independence and it says all men are created equal, and you think, how small is that all? That's a itty bitty tiny all, where God's all is, is magnificent. Well, and God's all is... Uh, is polychrome. It's not uh, homogenous. And, no, and we see that in, you know, I think that the Enlightenment, and I was listening to N.T. Wright a little on this, and it just hit home on me, uh, for me, really strongly. In the Enlightenment, it was all about homogeneity. Every, you know, we want, you know, and even our colorblind concept came out of that. And we, you know, all men are created equal. They're all supposed to be just like us, right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, the world will be great. And that comes from Gnosticism. You know, when you, yeah. When that's you look, melting pot, too. Let's all melt us, you know. So yeah. it's one big soup. It's like, oh, my goodness, and lose everything that makes us incredibly interesting. <laughs> right. And so when but Paul is civil. saying... When Paul is saying neither Jew nor Greek, barbarian nor Scythian, man nor woman, slave nor free, he doesn't then take the turn that the Gnostic contemporaries of his day said, for all can become. He says, no, you are all one in Christ already. So you still right. have those identities. The Gnostics, right. you know, you look at Gospel of Thomas, you look at some of the Valentinian literature, you've got, well women can only become only get into heaven if they become male become like men yeah. you know it's it's this fake egalitarianism where it's all about if you look just like me and act just like me then you're in but yeah. other and you can do that i'll let anyone do that 
but it's still what we're doing. Yeah. Oh, we, we still it's get what we're doing. I mean, if you're a woman in business and you want to get ahead, you got to play with the big boys. But that's not you how act, you can't you be think feminine. all this talk about white, white, uh, white dominance and white supremacy. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's not what Paul and Jesus are talking about. That's the point I'm making. The, the kingdom of God is different. The kingdom of God says, you will all be united by God's presence, but I made you this way. Mm -hmm. And I, your diversity matters to me. Amen. Yep. Amen. Gnostics say everyone needs to be the same. Do you want to take on the, the what is it, a Romans text? Yeah. How are we doing on time? We're about 45 minutes now, 40 minutes, close to. What's the Romans? 7, 15 through 25a. I can read it. It's good. Um, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. That's now, right. if I do what I do not want, I, I agree that the law is now if I do what I do not want I agree that the law is good but in fact it is no longer that I that do it but sin that dwells within me for I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh I can will what is right but I cannot do it for I do not do the good that I want but the evil I do not want is what I do now if I do what I want it is no longer I that I do that do it but sin that dwells within me. So if I find it to be, <clears throat> excuse me, it's very uh, circular. It's convoluted, yeah. <laughs> so if I find it to be law that when, I, that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand, for I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members, Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from the body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Basically, so I'm then, awful at this. So <laughs> then with my mind, so oh wait, it, there's a little bit more. So then with my uh, mind, I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh, I am a slave to the law of sin. Yes. And I get so confused, and I don't know which way to turn, and I do what I shouldn't, and I shouldn't do what I do, and... This is the story of my life. Yeah. <laughs> no, it is. Like, I was yeah. a hothead as a kid, and I would pray. I would pray, please don't let me be overreactive at school today. Please oh. don't let me do that thing. And yeah. every yeah. day, I would end up doing it. And it was hard. I'm like, what kind of God does this? Why are you set? Why'd you make me like this? Yeah. Like, and then you tell me, and then you tell me my burden is light and the yoke's easy. Yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> you, you come go. to the point where it has to be, or you're just yeah. gonna be, you're going to be conflicting with yourself all along. And I am at that point where I, I do have more grace for myself and for others because I've allowed myself to realize that I'm just, it's just how people can be. Well, and I think that's so important what you just said, because you recognize in yourself that you don't do what you should and you should do what you don't or whatever, however that works. Yeah. So that when you do see it in others, then it's grace. Just grace. part of being people. You have to offer grace to people who are just going in the wrong direction and you want to smack them up beside the head. You mm -hmm. have to say, wow. I think I look like that to other people. And enjoy, what, and enjoy what's beautiful when it's beautiful. Because there's an awful lot of beautiful. If you're spending your whole life freaking out about this, yeah. you're missing the, the blessings and you're missing the fun. I think, and you're I missing, think, you know? I think Paul ought to just stop flagellating himself quite so much. Chill out and just accept a little grace and mercy. I give it to him. No, but Somebody, you, but but said gonna, today, somebody said today, somebody said the purpose, the purpose of white guilt today is if you, if you feel guilty, you don't have to do anything because you're already feeling guilty. So <laughs> that, that saves you from having to really do anything to address the problem. Because yeah. after all, you're feeling guilty. You yeah. Know? And that, what, you, what else do you want from And you? that your own righteous yeah. thoughts are enough to change it. Yeah. But I think this goes with, see, I, I actually appreciate this about Paul because A, it makes Paul look human. Mm -hmm. And B, um, it 
identifies with that Matthew uh, passage, the 29th for 11, 29 about the humble of heart. You know, I, I think I said this in a previous one, but you know, everyone makes a big deal about the 12 fishermen. Oh, you know, Jesus pulled out 12 fishermen. Then, but God also chose the top PhD student under the top rabbi Gamaliel. You know, he also chose a superstar in Paul. Mm. And Paul has to work really, really hard at being humble. Yeah, to not be a total dick. And, and so he, here he <laughs> is writing to Rome, the city he wants to go to, the center of the, of the, the empire, you know, where he thinks that if Christianity explodes there, it will explode everywhere. And he's sending a woman to read this letter and admitting that he's a failure yeah. in the letter. He's doing this to make sure he's emphasizing the humility because he's writing to, to, to a church that is fractured between the Jewish Christians and the, and the pagan, uh, formerly pagan Christians, the Gentile Christians, and the weak and the strong, and they're battling with each other. Who's better before God? We're part of the chosen people. We're, we're not obeying the law. So, you know, who's better? And Paul is going and saying, listen, here's the deal. And by the way, I screw up all the time too. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I really think that this yeah, is a very big scripture for me. And yeah. Well, Paul, I mean, as Debbie knows, uh, Paul for me was, you know, not huge in my growing up. It was in seminary that I really, uh, you know, I feel like Paul's avoided a lot of times just because it's hard, you know. I love this text. I just don't, I don't like Paul's association of uh, the flesh and the sin with members. I mean, he's, he's, he just has a, a very Greek way of looking at the world of uh, flesh and spirit. And one is bad and one is good. And it's not a Hebrew. It does not make any sense in terms of him being a Hebrew scholar. It, it just doesn't. Yeah, I mean, he's trying to accommodate to, to the world in which he lives, the Roman world, the Greek world. But uh, I think but he, and Are maybe thinking, it was part of the decadence of his day. But, but uh, flesh is, is, is often interpreted as sex. And I think it's just meat. It's just like the stuff that we do. It's, as it's sarcasm. It's not, yeah. Brokenness of personness. The members. Well, 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 how do you interpret the members? The parts of your body. That was, yeah, great. parts of body. It's just, yeah. your, you know, the parts that make you, the, 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 the bits of dust that make you, you know, a, a meat an animated meat thing. Like, I don't think it's all about sex. No. I, I don't think much of it's about sex. No. No, I think it's Well, about, it's not. It's about, it's about gluttony. It's about... Uh, well, it's, it's about comfort. anything it's that about, diverts you. It's, it's all the not. things that serve this world and the fleshly world in which we live. Versus and we all the sin. spiritual world where it'll be much better and it's much different if we could live in the spiritual world rather than the fleshly world. It's a, it creates a false dichotomy. No, I don't think Paul is there. I think I don't Paul, think he's Gnostic. <laughs> yeah, I definitely don't think Paul is not, is tapping into Gnosticism here because Paul is all about the new creation, is all about um, you know, flesh being restored and you know there being redeemed, uh, made different. Redeemed, yes. Yeah. But it, it's about the 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 bones being raised in Ezekiel. It's about returning to the garden. It's about Shalom. Yeah. And I th I think that I don't think this is a a um Greek thing as much as it is him trying to explain it partially to Greeks. Because as a Jew in, in their in their categories. There, as a Jew, you've got forgiveness. I mean, you, you totally got atonement. You've totally got forgiveness. There's a whole section of the year that's for that. Um, what does Jesus do for us that hasn't already been done if it's just redemption? I mean, you could be redeemed as a Jew. It's not just that Jesus... If it's just forgiveness of sins, right. It's, it's the ushering in of the sin. new creation. It's, it's a complete... Yeah, it's a, a complete... total and full redemption. We are, you know? It's the next step. It's the next step. What's yes. the next step? Next it's part back of the to what you were saying, yeah. Yeah. So I don't. Yeah, I don't. I. I. I personally don't see that. You know, body hunger bad. Uh, thinking of God and being godly good. 
and you know in the in the pagan world there were plenty of people who believed in souls going to heaven so it's clearly not about souls going to heaven either right because that would be jesus not bringing anything new to the pagans yeah this is about the the what full heart? restoration of creation mm -hmm. the kingdom of god come to earth and that's shalom and that's shalom god's shalom mm -hmm. yeah. yeah well the big one to add on somewhere <laughs> sorry, sorry, John. I'm very. Uh, I, I'll, I'll refer to some things after. <laughs> We're still recording. Well, you guys are awesome, and um, likewise, I I really enjoy getting to talk about this stuff with you guys, and uh, and so yeah, for those who might be watching this, I hope you like it and you let us know. But we're gonna keep doing this probably anyway because we like getting with friends. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Sounds good. All right. Everyone keep safe. The numbers are not doing great things, especially in other places where people are coming from those places to our place. We want so much to be able to just have normalcy and let's uh, not rush it. Not okay. Rushing. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.